what uh, uh, could be the economic drivers in what could be provided. There's a lot of unemployment in Goa. How do you address these things? What are the skills in Goa? In certain villages, like Vishali, for example, is a village of potters with a sink. Another village is a village of you know, charis and uh, tinsmiths, whatever. All these strengths that each one has in the village can be put together. Some villages have strength of, you know, lots of teachers and things, lots of doctors. How can these things, instead of just shifting populations one side to another, can they actually create um, you know, work within the village here. And also agriculture has been a, a very highly neglected sector on thing. Most people think agriculture is, is non it's not profitable at mm. the moment here. Yeah. But the fact is that there are a lot of factors that make it that way. And the fact that you know you need a corporate movement to put it all together. You need prop, maybe irrigation system in, in certain places. You need financing bodies to, to help you. And maybe you need to look differently at agriculture. We've been planting rice, our forefather have been planting rice. We need to look possibly at another crop. You need to look at maybe organic means. You need to look at innovative means like things like permaculture, um, you know, drip irrigation, all sorts of you know, new methodologies which are coming in, into this world of, to, that can make agriculture really viable. Uh, good marketing strategies for these agriculture because these are problems that people face and that's why agriculture fails. But we're going to see a world food crisis coming on very soon and I think we need to be prepared for that and go I mean we've got some of the best rain I mean best rainfall in, in, uh, in most of India and we need to take we've got extremely fertile soils and to lose that would be a complete pity and, and we're, we're importing food from you know Belga and all the other surrounding states when we have all the capability to grow you know within our own state there, so why not well on the subject you also did mention about the green heritage growth. yeah I think people I mean when people talk about the heritage, the first thought comes to old buildings. Yeah, but heritage is also about uh, our natural heritage of you know uh, our, our greenscapes. So it's the fields, forests, mangrove, beaches, uh, all these sand dunes. All these are part of our um, our natural heritage. We need to preserve it. And it's a very delicate ecosystem that we have here. I mean, Goa has a biodiversity of nine on a scale of nine to ten, which is only second to the Amazon forest, the part of the Western Ghat region, which is extremely uh, diverse in its uh, uh, flora, fauna and we need to recognize this. We tend to ignore it. Uh, most people come to go and just stick to the beach. They don't realize what, what there is in the interland. They don't realize the devastation that's taking place due to mining, due to a lot of other activities in the area. And um, once people realize the thing that if we're part of a larger state, we, we cannot just think of our own little, you know, award. We cannot just think of our own little village. We need to think much beyond that because all those activities, if you look at mining and the siltation that takes place, the pollution that takes place, all that eventually affects even the towns that we live in here. The sort of quality of water we get, the quantity of water that we get. Yeah, I think the real estate industry was initially very worried about this regional plan thing of taking you know, the power down to the people and people deciding, especially with the protests that have been happening with mega housing and things yeah. like that. So there was this extreme fear that people will just block every project. But I think when people come to the table, we had an interesting meeting in Aldona where there were, there were two factions that came. There were developers and there were people who wanted to preserve, had a greatness, you know, nostalgic view of the village, yeah, wanted to preserve it. And yet they could they could understand what the other was trying to say, you know, in terms of and that's what needs to happen at, at every village. It, they need to understand that the economic development uh, needs to take place. Developers need to understand that they need to work within the framework so they don't spoil the character of the village because that, that helps in improving the, the actual value of the properties they're developing. Because if you build something like ground plus three in the middle of a village, immediately it looks like an eyesore. So say building on the framework of ground plus one, reducing a footprint, you know, taking people on board, introducing uh, more open space, uh, making sure that you, you have green concepts in your, in your building design where you harvest your water, use less power. All these things would have less uh, infrastructural um, sort of uh, footprint on the village and make the project a lot friendlier to the village. A lot of people are saying, oh, this, they're going to take our water and power. There may be some truths, some untruths, but there's a general fear that it's going to have a problem because the roads are getting to be more congested. They're, they're, there's a you know, visual pollution at times. There's big buildings sitting next to these small houses. So there is, a, there is this fear. Sometimes it's, it's just based on on what's happened, you know, in, in the case, like say, Carmona was 900 houses in the village of, you know, almost 900, uh, you know, uh, people almost, or 900 existing houses. So it's like doubling the thing with just one project. So people want to address that issue to prevent. Yes, they say we want development, but let it be to a scale which which allows the village to develop uh, uh, slowly. So developers are slowly realizing that yes, okay, we need to, in a way, be sensitive to the village issues, and in a way, partner with the people in the village because otherwise. 
I mean, how long can this animosity you know, take place? People need to say that, okay, fine, we have, there is some benefits that uh, developments can bring about, but they need to follow these sort of guidelines, yeah, you know, I mean, development can. How does your fraternity, the architectural engineering, uh, civil engineering take, uh, do, you, do they also subscribe to these ideas? I yeah. think they're, they're mixed bag in, in that sense. I mean, some people, are, yeah, they understand the issues and say that, yes, we have to have, you know, a control development. Some people think that, you know, okay, the more building you have, the more money you make, and therefore, you know, you, you must have as, as much as you can have. Yeah. But uh, I think in order to sustain ourselves, even in architects, and we have a responsibility as architects to really see that we provide uh, a, a better quality of life to the people around us. and. And at times, what the law allows is not really the best thing. Yeah. So we need to question the law at times, we need to modify the law at times to make sure that, that things are really in tune with uh, the place, in tune with the environment, and uh, good for the people. Yeah. But how heartening was it to be a part of that uh, task force yeah. and deciding on what is good for hmm. Goa? I was lucky to be part of, of, the, fast, of the task force and uh, um, it's a great learning experience for me. I mean, uh, though I've been involved in smaller planning exercises, to to, to sort of think on that at that scale was uh, is quite a challenge. And uh, and it's mainly for that reason that when you think on the larger scale, you realize that you, no matter how experienced you are, whether you're, you know you're Edgar Ribeiro or Charles Cree or something, like that, you there is a certain sort of feeling that comes about that you cannot completely decide. You can, you can understand the thing, you can create the framework, but it's up to the people to take it forward. And that's, that was the main reason that, you know, it has to go to the people, uh, not just for this people's participative thing, but you must take them on board because they have a lot of ideas themselves and on what their future is. They've been deciding all these years, you know, this, this top-down top process of planning has only come, you know, fairly recently before. Each village was deciding. Each village was, uh, was a unit in itself in deciding the future of the village through the communities, whatever system of controls that they had there. And that worked very well in those days. Uh, so why can't it work today? It, it, we just need a good support system put in place and all that past taken away from the people. It needs to be given back to them, but with capacity building, you know, with the sort of support finance initially that they need to actually see it through and an understanding. In the old days there was an understanding of what people, they weren't any architects, I mean they were just master craftsmen who built houses, you know, because there was a deep understanding to what, what was really needed in. And the same way they used to plan the way they, the way they decided where the fields would come, uh, how their water harvesting system would be, and the ingenious systems that we've inherited from our forefathers. And all this was planning, you know? and we can easily do it again if, if we are, if we educate ourselves, understand what's needed, and take it forward. Um, all I, I think it's just an appeal to the people to please participate, to take hold of it. Don't get discouraged by, you know, whatever corruption and, you know, bad panchayats and bad governance. It, it's a great opportunity. There are ways and means, there are support groups available to actually take this forward. And people must, you know, participate in the plan to take it forward and, and make it their plan, yeah.